I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some of your evening with us. I'm really happy to introduce to you tonight John Wallace. Appreciate you coming. Flew in from California just to yeah, do this. Right. I appreciate that so much. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all. Well, you've got a wonderful story, and John's actually written a book. i start out with this. It's actually starting <coughs> at the finish line. Um, sorry. There we go. Starting at the finish line, John Wallace, and it's such a wonderful read and so many interesting little stories. A lot of thought went into that, and uh, you've, you've got a great story to, to share. So Thank let's you. get started and tell us a little bit about your beginnings as a Mormon. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> well, I guess it really starts with my first church experience, which was actually the first Baptist church of Lakewood. I grew up in Southern California. Oh. My parents had actually been raised Methodist, but uh, that was the first church I ever attended, and uh, in 1973, my parents converted to Mormonism. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I was eight years old at the time. I just, you know, was along for the ride. Easy to get <clears throat> baptized at that point, was it? Indeed, and, and just from the get-go, it was such a wonderful experience. I, I, I remember at the Baptist church, my sister, my middle sister and I were sort of invisible. No one really ever knew our names. And uh, as soon as we joined the Mormon church and we became part of the, the Lakewood First Ward in the uh, East Long Beach State, everyone knew me and, and now I'm in Cub Scouts and uh, it was fantastic. They were very warm and welcoming. My parents really appreciated that too. Yeah, I'll bet. But, uh, and, so, uh, and so my childhood was fantastic. Very I loved active in the church. Very much so, yeah. Church. Primary, of course that was midweek and yeah. I guess it still is, and uh, church on no, Sunday. No, I think and, they've changed primary to Sundays. So. Oh, they have yeah, now, okay. Yeah. So, seminary um, should take. Uh, yes, seminary. I, I I didn't appreciate that so much because we had to ride our bikes to <laughs> to the church Early house morning, at maybe. six in the morning. Yeah, yeah. but um, I've always said that I, I I very much appreciate my Mormon foundation because it kept me on the straight and narrow when I needed it the most. Really. And so it, it's interesting because a lot of my Christian friends they'll they'll say, oh man, that must have been a drag growing up Mormon. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, it learned a all. lot of good lessons. I Absolutely. Guess. It was all a preparation for me and no regrets. At yeah. All. You ended up going on a mission. Where'd you go? Uh, indeed. Yeah. I went to the Buenos Aires South Mission yeah. uh, in the fall of 1984. Uh, I put a year in at uh, BYU. Actually, I went to BYU Hawaii as well Oh. Uh, before my mission. Uh, came back and finished up my degree at BYU and then on to dental school at UCLA. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've often asked people, uh, uh, missionary, former missionaries, that um, what what you thought you were preaching when you were out there. Did you feel like you were preaching Jesus, or did you feel like you were preaching the church? That, that's a great question, and it for me it was sort of a, a wake up call in that I noticed that as I, you know, the first discussion was primarily, um, you know, life is eternal. We we live after this life, and and there's a God in heaven that loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. And, and God has a, this plan of, of salvation for you. And as long as I was preaching God and Jesus and what Jesus did for us, I felt fantastic. I was very confident. Hmm. Um, I, I felt like there was some, some spiritual tailwind with that. <laughs> yeah. um, but as I mentioned to you earlier, as soon as we would get over to the more esoteric Mormon doctrine, <clears throat> 
and for whatever reason, it was primarily the, the angelic visitations of Moroni and Peter, James, and John, John the Baptist. Those kinds the, of... The restoration of the church and the priesthood. Yeah. There was something inside of me that would tighten up. Really? And whereas I had been free and easy the week before visiting with this family, for example, now I'm tight. And, and there, there would come that point also where I, I would need to bear testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, yeah. of, of the church itself, of course, sure. and the prophetic calling of Joseph Smith, and I couldn't do it. So I, I got creative, Earl, because I didn't want to get sent home. I was having a great time, you know. Um, so you and used so, other words. Yeah, that's uh, right. And so I would get to the end of where, where I was supposed to say, I know this church is true. Yeah. I would find myself saying, uh, the church is a wonderful organization that provides many opportunities for service. <laughs> and instead of, I know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, uh, Joseph Smith was an amazing man and had tremendous uh, leadership skills and, and charisma. I haven't lied. Yeah, <laughs> and I could live with myself. Now, one um, companion in particular sniffed me out. And uh, we're still best friends to this very day. Wow. And he's still active in the church. Uh, I love him to death. He's my very best friend. But, but he knew. He knew as, as early as 1985 that um, I was happy to do my part uh, t to serve the God, mm -hmm. uh, God any way I could, but that I didn't really believe. Wow. I wonder if people uh, paying attention in fast and testimony meetings might hear those same kinds of words or same omissions or same playing around with words if yeah, they really pay right. attention. <clears throat> I, I'm encouraged by the fact that on websites and blogs these days, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but uh, Latter-day Saints conversing with other Latter-day Saints, they want to know, are you a TBM or a CM? Are you a true believing Mormon or are you a cultural Mormon? Oh. I'm very encouraged by that. Uh, 30 years ago, that would not have been the case. You, you would you never would identify yourself as merely a cultural Mormon, yeah. even though we knew that they exist, existed, <laughs> and, and ultimately I became a cultural Mormon. Yeah. But, and as I mentioned to you earlier too, I, I wanted to know that it was true. I had invested all these years and, and wrapped up my entire identity as a Latter-day Saint. I, I needed it to be true. I wanted it to be true. Yeah, you were married in the temple. Uh, correct, married in the yeah. temple, um, uh, elders quorum president, the whole thing. But there was just this nagging problem. It started, by the way, in my junior year in high school. I had heard, because I, I, I certainly don't remember being taught it directly, not in Sunday school or primary. Uh, and maybe I was asleep at the wheel, but by the age of 17, or right around the age of 17, I first heard that God was once a man, just a regular guy. A little couplet there. Uh, yes, that's right. And that, and that ultimately the objective of my religion is that I would become someday as God, or that I would rule and reign over my own creation. Yeah. And it just, you know, I, the only way I can describe it, Earl, it felt like a mule kicked me in the stomach. Really? At 17? It, it, it was so devastating and offensive to my spirit. I credit it to my early sort of uh, foundational um, faith, perhaps, that I learned in Sunday school in the Baptist church. Wow. Uh, uh, otherwise, it may just have been, it just did not resonate. It just didn't feel yeah. right that uh, we could become God. Yeah, it was decidedly wrong to yeah. me, and I never could get over that. Did you ever share that with anybody? Not really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, although, here you went through the motions for the next many years. <laughs> indeed. And that's probably the best way we could describe it. But I was diligent in going through the motions yeah. in terms of obeying the word of wisdom. And, sure. Uh, you know, we go to the temple from time to time. I never felt comfortable in the temple. And that, incidentally, was the second shoe to drop. And that is my first temple experience. I thought, nah, I, I, I can't put my finger on this, but this does not feel right to me. I don't feel comfortable here, and I don't want to come back. You were sensitive to the Spirit in some way. What, what, what do you think he was trying to say to you? <laughs> well, looking back now, yeah. I believe that it was a preparation. I think the Lord left me in uh, the Mormon Church all those years to just be uh, deeply you know, indoctrinated, to yeah. understand it thoroughly, and to understand the minds and the hearts of the Latter-day Saints. And what you've been able to accomplish since, perhaps. But had you ever heard of masonry in the temple or the occult? No, no that, that came much later. I, I learned much more about Mormon history uh, in, in the years you know, subsequent to my departure from the church. Yeah, in I'm fact, the same way. I, I left in 1993-94, and I really never looked back until about five or six years ago, and I just started reading and I, I read uh, my, uh, uh, Mike Quinn's uh, uh, Magic World View. Okay. I read Grant Palmer. The Insider's View. Fond, that's right. Grant's a, a good friend of mine. I read um, 
has become a good friend, uh, Fawn Brody and uh, Richard Bushman, mm -hmm. which really intrigued me because Bushman is a, an a, active lawyer. That's right. Saying, yeah. and, but yet, I think more and more we're seeing uh, a courage on the part of these really yeah. brilliant historians that are not afraid to look at the real Joseph Smith. Yeah, Grant Palmer was an institute director, and uh, that's right. Yeah. So uh, you went from you came. You said you, there was a period of time there between your leaving Mormonism, knowing that it wasn't true, That's and then right. coming to. Well, when I left Mormonism, Houston. the only God I knew was Mormon God, and yeah. I was ashamed that I couldn't live His religion anymore, and I didn't know where to turn. Uh, so I'm 28 years old, uh, recently divorced at that time, uh, single. Uh, I was met with some success quite quickly in dentistry, so I, I had some discretionary spending yeah. and uh, uh, I'm not proud of this but it was sort of party on and okay. I had a great time and I went out into the world and the farther I got into let's just say a worldly lifestyle which again I'm not proud of but in retrospect I'm sort of thankful for it it, it certainly broadens my spectrum of people that I can reach oh absolutely I, I, I just missed God more and more he just was tugging at me and I I missed him and I missed belonging to him is and, the best way I can explain it. And did it. you think that you just missed out on the Mormon church? Did you think that's where it was? As the years went on, I, I felt more and more comfortable with my decision to leave the Mormon church. But as it turns out, um, I, I met a young lady. I fell head over heels in love with her. I ended up marrying her. Yeah. That didn't work out so hot. But the point of the story is that, that Nikki invited me to her little church. And it was called Calvary Chapel West Grove. Mm -hmm. I said, what religion is that? She said, we're not really a religion. We just study the Bible. I think we just follow Jesus. Okay. <laughs> Whoever heard of such a Whoever thing. Whoever heard of such a thing. And so, I, but as, for as long as I live, I'll never forget my very first Sunday there. Yeah. I was in a shirt and tie. Sure. I look like Bishop Earl. <laughs> and uh, everyone else is in shorts and flip-flops. Yeah. And um, She hadn't uh, told you how to dress. <laughs> <laughs> no. And even if she had told me, I would have still needed to have risen to yeah. the occasion. To, yeah. You know. yeah. So our pastor got up and he said, hey, we want to welcome everybody this morning as we gather together. He says this every Sunday. That's why I know it so well. As we gather together to, to worship the Lord and to celebrate God's free gift of eternal life. Won't you please stand for our opening song? And the band kicks in and... People are clapping and this little guy next to me, just, just the joy and the exuberance. I had never seen anything like it. They weren't and there because they had to be. That's not at sure. all. Yeah. And what's interesting, Earl, is that I felt powerfully God's spirit just burning in me. And I thought, wait a minute, what's the Holy Ghost doing here? <laughs> oh. Well, I just assumed he followed me in, you see. Oh my goodness. Yeah, he followed the one Mormon guy in there. <laughs> But it, uh, it rocked me, and it, uh, yeah. looking back now, it changed my life. Wow, and this pastor has been quite an influence. Oh, he is, yeah, Pastor Brad Young. He is still my senior pastor, and he is my father, my spiritual father in, in the gospel because over the years, although it, it, I, it's not that I just came right over to, oh, Jesus did it all, and I'm saved by grace. It took me many years. In fact, in my book, I said it took me nine years so be patient with yourself, Latter-day Saints that are coming out of the church, but don't be that patient. Yeah. I, I, I had an ego and a need to be better than you that would rival almost anybody. And I, and I think that's why it took so many years. Again, I'm ashamed you of that had too. You to just had to be right. <laughs> yes, I, well, give me a chance to be better than you. Yeah. Please, Lord. Are you, because ultimately, and, and I, yeah, you may remember this from my book, um, as, the, as the, the foundational message of Pastor Brad's sermon that day, and, and often in his sermons, it is that, that eternal life is a gift. It is a gift. This is not difficult terminology. And, and that we are equal in Christ. We are in, Christ imputes his righteousness onto us, and so we are equal uh, when we come to saving faith in Christ. Yeah. So then my next thought was, wait a minute, so I get to go to heaven? Yes. And so does this guy? <laughs> this guy's got tattoos. He's got like a teardrop, you know? This guy's done time in prison. <laughs> He gets to go to heaven too. We're tied. Yes, we're tied. That, <laughs> that was amazing? difficult for me to grasp. Now, we don't understand that as Latter-day Saints, do we? Uh, no, and I think there are a few reasons for that. Um, at the risk of offending some, I would say, for I, let's just, I'll just speak for myself. It was my pride. The oh, pride I, I of- I agree, totally. Yeah, I don't, here, here was my thought process when I was a devout Latter-day Saint. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't use bad language. I wear the garments of the holy priesthood. 
Uh, and I, I don't go to strip clubs, and I don't. Uh, what else? What other outward things don't I do? All kinds of outward things. Yeah. I pay tithing. Sure. I do. Fa I fast once a month, and that's really hard. You try it sometime. You see, <laughs> I, I'm better than you. I'm better than you, and I can I can prove that through my behavior. Yeah, my good works. That's right. Yeah. The, um, the the turning point for me, from a theological standpoint, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, Bishop Earl, that I, I knew that Mormonism was missing the mark, but I couldn't articulate it. I couldn't, I didn't have a good enough argument. When, when my Christian friends would come to me and say, hey, what a bummer, man, your, your, your parents are still Latter-day Saints. Yeah, they are. Oh, isn't that a bummer that they're not saved? Now, I would rarely engage in that conversation, but in, in the quiet of my own heart, I would go, oh, you know, I, I, would, I would fall back on Romans 10.10. 10. Mom and dad believe that, they, they say with their mouth that Jesus is Lord. Mom and dad believe that, uh, uh, God raised him from the dead. And of course, in Romans, it says, if you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart, you will be saved. So here's how I would rationalize um, the eternal um, outcome of, of, of my, my parents' souls and my best friends, my sisters. My, my whole world is still very much Mormon. Yeah. And that is, uh, they believe in Jesus. And so that's the core. That's the ice cream. And, uh, and Mormonism is the caramel, the hot fudge, the whipped cream, the nuts, and the cherry on top. And it obscures their Christianity. But when, when mom and dad pass, uh, the Lord will simply strip away all the superfluous Mormon stuff, and he'll see their um, core Christianity, and all will be well. <laughs> and then I read and grasped Galatians Paul's letter to the Galatians, and in particular, Galatians chapter 5. That's what motivated me to write this book. Oh, okay. And that is, Paul says, look, it is either a gift, you are saved by grace or by works, but you can't have both. So he says, if you, if you, if you receive circumcision and all that that represents, okay, you are severed from Christ. Christ will be of no benefit to you. You have fallen from grace. Now, he, notice, Paul does not say, you're not going to heaven. He says, don't you know that if you receive circumcision, or if you wear your garments, pay your tithing, do, if you assign value to your outward works of obedience, you are obligated to obey the whole law. Lots yeah. of luck. Yeah. That's your only other out. And in your book, you say that that actually draws you further away from Christ's free gift. God, through Paul, says that you are severed you have fallen from grace and you are severed from Christ. Now that's a tough one. Yeah. But now 10 years, 20 years removed from Mormonism, I go, oh yes, that's what's wrong. Oh, but Mormons are such good people. And you know what my response is? What? Yes, they are. And that's the problem. They're good people and they assign goodness to themselves and build upon that goodness. My parents are the most wonderful people you will ever meet in your entire life. <laughs> And uh, I asked my mother recently, hey, mom, heaven forbid, if something were to happen to you tomorrow, where would you go? Oh, honey, she said, I, I don't know. Oh. Well, mom, I said, aren't you and dad basically geared up for the celestial kingdom? Yeah. Oh, gosh. And so I went through all the, the commandments. Don't you obey all these things? Well, I, uh, and they just don't know, of course. They just don't know. That's right. Now, you've mentioned that you know more about Mormonism now than you did as I felt that I days. needed to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately... And by the way, my, my book is for the struggling Latter-day Saint. In, in my introduction, there I said... There are so many wonderful stories in here. It's just really... Well, I appreciate and, and that. And, and I know it's available at utlm.org. Uh, yes. Also, I have a website. It's startingatfinishline.com. Starting also, amazon.com, okay. uh, Barnes & Noble. Now, Amazon, it's easier to download the ebook. We're working on a little bit of a technical issue with the, the paperback, but it, it'll be available. Yeah. It is available, but it says ships in one to three months or something, which is hogwash. <laughs> but all the major outlets. Well, yeah. you've got a couple of wonderful stories in there. Uh, I don't know if you'd want to share any of them, uh, garbage and gold bricks or, or the lady in, that's in the story. I like the garbage and the gold bricks because it speaks to this very thing we're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says, uh, the, the true worshipers of God, we, we don't put any confidence in the flesh. That is in our ability to please God or, or to do anything good for that matter. Uh, we put all of our trust in Christ, in Christ alone. He says, but if anybody uh, could put confidence in the flesh, it's probably me. And he lists all of his bona fides. Yeah, yeah. But then everything changes in chapter, verse 7, uh, Philippians 3, 7. He says, but... All of these things, all of the obedience, the zeal, the heritage, the circumcision, the whole kit and caboodle, 
it is garbage. I, I count it as loss so that, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own, although he just got through saying that How he, righteous and that's fulfilling right. he was. <laughs> yeah, and I don't doubt that. You know, he was he was the Hebrew of Hebrews, yeah, you know. Yeah. He says not having n- not having a righteousness of my own by the law, but that which comes from God and is by faith. And so anyway, my story is this. You're taking the garbage out one day and you got two hands full of, you know, stinky garbage and glad bags. Your best friend comes running up because he won the lottery and he's got two shiny gold bricks worth about a million dollars. He says, Earl, Earl, I won the lottery and and I don't have time to explain. Here, take these. But your hands are full and you can't take them because you got garbage in your hands. What to do? Well, it's the no-brainer of the century. You set the bags down, (laughs) receive the gold, give him a big hug and he'll explain later. Um, And yet, uh, the degree to which we feel that our hands are occupied by good stuff so that's why Paul says, I, 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 had, I had to reckon all of this stuff as that's complete hard. garbage and not at all effective in, in gaining righteousness so that. So you got to drop the bags so that you can get the gold. And it's just that simple. And what you're saying is that the Mormons feel like they're good, that they've done good works and that they stand well before God that way. That's right. Although even Isaiah says, Without you know, accepting the Isaiah gift. says, our best righteousness our best glad bags are but filthy rags to a holy god yeah but see joseph smith took god and said he, he's a man he's a glorified man and that's why i think mormons lack that wow factor if if i can become god someday and god was once a man that shrinks that gap if you will oh, yeah. down to where uh okay and so it I, makes I can sense be there. to me i can do that and as you said that was one of your first impacts as as man is god once was that's right yeah that's right. i'm thankful I, I'm, I'm thankful that god was revealing that to me at an early age Wow, yeah, and, that's uh, I didn't know what it was going to lead to, but... Uh, yeah. yeah, so Jesus means a little bit differently to you now, I would suspect. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, <laughs> he's everything now. And I, you know, I used to hear Christians, they'd say, you know, before I gave my life to the Lord, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Because my thought was, well, if I give my life to the Lord, I, I got to go to work. Like, <laughs> who's going to live my life, yeah. you know? <laughs> I didn't understand. But now I see that Christ, and this is why he said it is finished to Telestai. He did it all. Christ purchased my salvation on the cross. And now all I can do, and I happily do it, is I say, thank you. Thank you. I receive. Thank you for this free gift. Now, the reason I think, we talked about this earlier, I think the Latter-day Saints struggle with this idea of, oh, gee, you know, Jesus did it all. Well, wouldn't that be nifty? They don't understand what happens next. And that is... As we come to saving faith in Christ, we are filled with God's Spirit, and then and only then can we actually obey Him. Yeah. I've never been more obedient, and I, I don't mean to boast, but anybody that knows me will tell you, I've never loved God more. I, I've never been more obedient to, to God's laws. I love it. And less judgmental, more love for your fellow man, I probably. I have nothing to judge people. I'm guilty of every single sin, yeah. I, I, you know, Isn't as I look in, into my past, yeah. which is why I said, I'm sort of thankful I had those dark years. What, what, what am I going to judge you for? You've been taught. You've been taught so much in both your Mormon Mormon life, your period of inactivity or uh, uh, discovery, I guess. That's what right. about the Bible now for you? Oh, I love it. It just it just uh, about ten years ago it came alive to me, and I I just I crave it. Uh, I, I, it's, it's how I start my day. Yeah. Um, it just becomes so crystal clear. As a Latter-day Saint, I remember at BYU, I had a New Testament course, and we just jumped right over the letters of Paul. Oh, <laughs> See, isn't that now, amazing? now that I know, now I understand Philippians and Romans and Galatians. Yeah. Now I see why the Latter-day Saints really kind of need those. to skip over Paul. They can't afford to teach Paul, because Paul says that by the works of the law, no one can be justified. That, that it is, uh, that we, are, we are saved by grace through faith, and this not of yourselves, yeah. not of yourselves. And yet we dismiss that by saying that the Bible's only reliable. It, yeah, it's in, in my book, right? I make it a point. You may have noticed yeah. there's an entire section. I, I felt the need to defend the authority of the Bible yeah. because ultimately you can share Ephesians 2. It's fa- in fact, it's like your second chapter. I, yeah, I needed to. What, why go through, uh, the, the subtitle is The Gospel of Grace for Mormons. I want to be able to explain what Jesus taught, what Paul taught, but in language that the Latter-day Saints can understand. Yeah. And I'm thankful, excuse me, that I still speak Mormonese. I, I can, I, 
I, I have the ability to remember, and I'm thankful for this, yeah. what it felt like to be LDS and what it felt like to read verses like Ephesians 2 yeah. that were saved by grace alone. And, and the, the easy and I think unfortunate cop-out, which is, well, the Bible isn't translated correctly. Well, we know for a fact that the Old Testament was translated correctly yeah. because of the Dead, Dead sea, sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls, yeah. C case closed. And, and so different than the Joseph Smith translation. Indeed. Well, believe it or not, our time is just zoomed by Rats. and I'm just looking here to see if there was something that I uh, is there something you'd like to say to the LDS or yeah you know I I uh, recently read Lynn Wilder's book and I've uh, unveiling grace yes yeah, and, and the Wilders and I we've befriended each other and I I think Micah Wilder had great advice I'd like to reiterate his advice and I I, I, I can't think of anything better Micah invites the Latter-day Saints to read the Bible as if you were a child this was the challenge from the Baptist uh, uh, Minus, pastor back right. in uh, yeah. Winter Garden, Florida, yeah. uh, which was he, he was reluctant to take that challenge, but he did. He said, what do you mean? Read the Bible as if you were a child, not to prove that your religion is true or that this religion is false. Just read the Bible as if you had a clean slate just to see what did Jesus, who is Jesus and what did he teach? What did he teach? What he didn't teach? What did Paul teach and what did, uh, yeah. yeah, that's and right. what they didn't teach. Correct. Yeah. Now, I understand that part of their argument is, well, there are many plain and precious truths removed from the Bible, but there's there's really no um, uh, paleographic or inscriptional evidence to, to back that up. It's no, just sort of lots of New Testament manuscripts. Twenty five thousand, to be exact. To well, to be uh, <laughs> approximately, yeah. approximately yeah. that support the New Testament and the words that are there. Uh, I, rather than make fancy arguments, I trust that the the genuine seeker of truth within the Christian context, of course, that reads the New Testament as if they were a child, it, it, that's all they need. I really truly believe that. And by the way, much of the Book of Mormon is really quite palatable to me. I, I mean, you've got a couple zingers in I there. I agree. Most of the Book of Mormon Most of Mormonism isn't in the Book of Mormon. Correct. Yeah. I, I reread the book. I've reread it several times, even in recent years. And I, now you got- One you, God. You, you got, oh, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, the Father, the, uh, the one God in the form of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Um, now you got your second Nephi 25, 23, couple which- little glips Gets them going off in different directions. Yeah. Moroni 10, I'm not too fond of, and that you've got to remove all ungodliness yeah. uh, so that, you know. The, the and how did the Holy Spirit get here <laughs> when you walk in? <laughs> yeah, that's right. He followed me in. Well, John, the time's up. I appreciate you coming so much. It's been and a pleasure. the Michelle. effort that you've taken to get over here to, I wouldn't have to share your story. And I, I know you're going to touch some hearts and some, some lives. I, I pray people will listen and pay attention because... Uh, Mormons are following this gospel of Joseph Smith, aren't they? And not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Indeed. Good night.